Good evening. Oh. I would like to call to order the March 5th, 2018 Lake Washington School Board evening meeting. And thank you all for coming this evening. Um, first off, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the March 5th agenda. Move approval. Uh, second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director Lip La Liberty that we approve the agenda. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. And tonight, I'd like to welcome our host school. And so, Dr. Pierce, will you introduce our host school this evening? Yes, we're very excited this evening to have Stella Scola here as our host school. And so I'd like to first introduce you to Aaron Bowser, who's principal at Stella Scola. And uh, we'll have you get started and introduce your team and uh, <laughs> so forth. OK, hi, Bregan. <laughs> Oh. or that one there all right here we are very pleased to be here this evening Stella Scola started um, in the September of 2000 and we are now in our 17th year our mission at Stella Scola is to offer middle school students a comprehensive consistent classical curriculum delivered in an environment with high academic and behavioral standards with solid teacher support. We offer this in a very unique way. We have 30 students at each grade level, grades six, seven, and eight. There are 90 students total, many of them in the audience tonight. And um, it's really looking at uh, through integrated curriculum in chronological historical themes. So students get the opportunity to experience a lot of art and um, dance within the core subjects and it really becomes a close-knit family at Stella as students move through the grades 6th, 7th, and 8th with their same 30 students as their cohort. I could stand up here all night and talk about how wonderful Stella is and I know that you would like to hear from me all night long about Stella, but instead we have our students and staff who will be telling you about their experience at Stella and what makes it such a wonderful place to go to school and to work. As you can see, our test scores are very strong and our teachers really strive to ensure that each and every student is meeting standard or exceeding standard. And we appreciate all that they do for our students as well as the partnerships that they form with our parents. I am going to uh, hand it over to our sixth grade teacher, uh, Hattie Midbow. Hello. Um, I'm Hattie Midbo, I'm the sixth grade teacher, and I just wanted to share why I love teaching at Stella. Um, our students come with a passion to learn, and the way our day is structured is that we are able to integrate uh, math, science, English, and art, and then Latin in seventh and eighth grade into our historical themes that we teach chronologically. Um, and so for in instance, in sixth grade, we start with our study of early humans and Pangea and work our way through ancient civilizations, uh, and we finish with ancient Greece. And now here is one of my students, current students, Gayatri. Hi, my name is Gayatri, and one thing I really like about Stella is that we do a lot of hands-on activities, and the hands-on activities really help me ne learn new things in a really fun way, and also they help me remember what I'm learning better. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Carrie Peterson, the seventh grade teacher at Stella. I teach the same core subjects in the seventh grade, except for uh, they start taking Latin one uh, this year. And we travel, our historical themes travel from early and ancient Rome all the way through early explorers. Uh, teaching at Stella really provides me with an awesome environment to challenge myself as a teacher, but also to set really high expectations for my students and watch them and support them in overcoming challenges and become excited about learning and discovering new things. Uh, and this is Uri Middleman, one of my current seventh grade students. He hello, my name is Uri Middleman. Something I really love about Stella is the challenging work that can prepare me for my future years. 
Some um, um, so, some of the things that we learn in Stella include Latin, and um, the, we learn in history Rome, about Romans and Vikings. Uh, thank you. Hello, you can come up with me. I'm Brigitte Tennis, and I teach the eighth grade at Stella Scola Middle School. And one thing that I really enjoy about Stella is that it allows me to teach in a creative way, a little bit out of the box, and explore what works with kids and what doesn't. Um, it also allows me to grow and stretch in different ways. And one thing I really, really enjoy is getting to know the students deeply as human beings because I have them for all the subjects. And so I can see them in their weaker subjects, but also in their very strong subjects. And this is one of my current, current students right now, Sara. Hi, uh, my name is Sara, and I'm in eighth grade here at Stella. Um, one thing that I really like about Stella is that the subjects are integrated, and that really helps me because then I'm able to understand things and relate them to each of the other subjects, so I am able to remember the information a lot better. I also really like that we have a lot of projects, um, which are all really fun, and they're also quite challenging. And often we do these projects in groups or pairs. So not only, me, only am I learning about the subjects, but I'm also learning and improving my teamwork and my communication skills, which is really important for high school and beyond. And now we have Julian and Catherine, alumni of Stella School, that are coming to chat with you. Hello, so this is a slide showing some of the colleges that students from Stella have ended up at. And even before college, students are already going to honors and AP classes, showing their love of rigor and learning that Stella has helped to instill in them. So I'm Katherine Jensen, and I am a junior at Wheaton College this year studying computer science and English. So as you can imagine, I also really appreciated the integration of all the subjects. I also appreciated all the surprises that Stella held and the flexibility that that encouraged as we take a lot of field trips and things wouldn't go as planned, or you'd be in the classroom and a cake would come from the closet. So, <laughs> um, one thing that Stella has really left me with is just a lot of confidence and leadership skills. Stella is a very challenging school, but you don't do it alone, and you overcome each challenge, and you become more confident, and you also learn to work in groups with a variety of people, and you learn when to lead and when to follow to help everyone succeed. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Julian. I am a Stella alumni. I'm currently a senior at the University of Washington studying uh, cybersecurity and informatics. Um, but you know, not everybody that goes through Stella ends up being a computer scientist. Uh, in the upper right hand corner, that's one of my old friends, Zach Sweetzer, who uh, just did his first commercial plight, flight as an airline pilot. Uh, we have people go into technical theater, world dance travel. Uh, you know, nursing, some people are lawyers, people are you know, starting families now, it's kind of scary. But, uh, <laughs> you know, what I really took away from Stella and what I really enjoyed about, you know, my time at Stella was uh, just, it's really individual education, right? You have the same class, you have the same teacher for seven periods, you know, every single quarter for the whole entire year. And I wasn't always a good student, you know, I had D's, I think, when I started at Stella. But, you know, having teachers there that, like, I guess know you before you know yourself are really, really important. And another thing I want to point out, uh, the little friends for life little bit, those two girls uh, in the middle uh, were actually in my class at Stella. I'm still really close friends with a lot of people that I went through Stella with. And where I could kind of go over all of the you know, different things I did at Stella that like brought me together, made me really close with them, I think a short slideshow would be a little bit better.
Hi, my name is Todd Jensen. I am the current president of the PTO. And I just want to say thank you. What an incredible school this is, and thank you for the opportunity that it's afforded my children. Um, my older daughter just spoke when she was in sixth grade. She was a shy, introverted sixth grader. She had a very fixed mindset, wasn't sure exactly what she could do, and I saw her come out of her shell. She grew into a growth mindset that was just incredible. It has set her up for life, and she ended up was with a first graduating class in a STEM high school, which is also an incredible program. And now she's in computer science at Wheaton. So just never would have thought that she would have gone all the way from sixth grade to where she is now without this program. So I just want to thank you. It's not just the academics, it's the life skills that they learned during Stella. Thank you. Hi, my name is James Gower, and I have uh, two kids that uh, went through Stella. They are now 28 and 26. Uh, they've been through college, and uh, to repeat what was just said, uh, it, the amazing thing, one, I, um, I still volunteer for this because I believe so much in this program. It's such, it's the right thing at a very, at an age when they really need it. With my kids, the surprising thing was how much they ended up using these skills in college. That was where it really came to the fore. Not only the academic skills, but the project management skills and things like that. So Stella has remained a part of their life now well into their adulthood. So I hope you'll continue to support this great program. Thank you. All right, and in closing, we would like to uh, thank you so much for listening to our presentation and for allowing choice options so that people can learn and explore in different ways. And oh, gee, I think you've just been flash mobbed. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> well, first off, thank you very much. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, the interdisciplinariness of the school is fabulous to see, and obviously with the graduates and the parents and the students, it shows fabulous work being done. So thank you very much. I have to say, I think uh, this wins the prize for the most attended uh, uh, choice or uh, host school presentation. Curious, can you raise your hand if you're here for the host school presentation? Wow. You win. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Thank you so Thank you. much. Amazing presentation. And I wanted to say that the final performance was by our by former Stella students, they were eighth graders last year, and 20 out of the 30 students from last year's eighth grade class really wanted to be a part of this, and it was something that they learned last year and still remember quite well. That's so, amazing. So, yeah, thank, thank you. you so thank much, you Aaron, much. and um, the whole team. Anybody else want to say I anything? just want to say, my son wasn't as lucky as you kids. We got waitlisted, so I would love to come and visit your school and see what it really is like. I want to thank you, all of y'all for showing up too because I know how tough it is to go through Latin. I actually went through Latin in public school and I thought I was the only person that ever could say that again, but thank goodness you guys are doing it. Uh, and if you can imagine having a, a Latin teacher who was a, a Brooklyn native teaching to Oklahoma kids and the accent actually worked out, you guys are going to have it made, okay? <laughs> I just wanted to say that, yes, thank you for showing up in a battalion. Um, and <clears throat> truth is, in 10 years on the school board, that's the first time I've ever seen jazz hands during a school board meeting. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. We know that many of the students have homework that they might need to do or other places to be. We will be continuing into public comment and school safety. So if you are interested in staying, please do. Um, but if you also need to leave, please feel free to stand up at this point and you can please exit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we need to reset the. Thank you. He's going to set that. You might, I don't know.
All right, let's go ahead and start the meeting as people are exiting. Um, the next step that we'd like to do tonight, it is. Live cheese is not very hot. Um, Please do like, grab a cookie. They're moving. <laughs> We have moved up the superintendent's report tonight, so we'll be speaking tonight in regards to school safety. So, Dr. Pierce, will you go ahead and you can take the lead. Okay, uh, yeah. uh, Diana, are our mics turned up to their normal volume? They seem a little soft tonight. Okay. Thank you. Okay, my clicker seems to. Okay. Okay, that that seems a little better, I think, for the microphone volume. So, uh, thank you, Siri. I asked to uh, have superintendent's report uh, come at the front of the meeting tonight because I wanted to do a special safety-focused update uh, for tonight's superintendent report and wanted to lead with that. So, uh, I want to begin by expressing our commitment to safety as a school district. The safety and security of our staff and our students is a top priority. As you all know, we have a strategic goal that uh, says that we need to ensure and provide safe and innovative learning environments for our students. And so tonight I want to talk about in detail the established district safety structure that we have in place as well as our comprehensive emergency management plan. You'll see through the presentation tonight that we do continually assess and we have systems and processes for continually assessing our district-wide safety needs, implementation of our safety measures and protocols, a process for identifying training needs, and a process to ensure that we are responding to changing conditions. So, uh, Sadly, after a tragic event occurs like the one in Florida, often we do a reminder out to parents about these are the things that we're doing associated with safety because often many questions come up. Annually, as part of a school board presentation, uh, we do a program report on safety. So the board may recall that that uh, program report was shared in October. Uh, toward the beginning of the year. And aspects of that will be touched on again tonight, but I want to go a, a lot more in depth, and uh, more in depth than what was communicated out through that um, Special Connections uh, newsletter. Sort of the purpose of doing that again is often after a tragic event, there's many questions that are surfaced in terms of what are we doing uh, to ensure you know, that we're doing everything within our control to uh, ensure our students and staff are safe. Um, and through that level of communication, it's, it's not possible to go very in depth. And so uh, since that communication, of course, there's been a lot of comments and questions, uh, really not just in our district, but all across the state, all across the nation when it comes to school safety. So I wanted to take some uh, real dedicated time tonight and uh, go pretty in depth uh, in terms of our safety structure and comprehensive emergency management plan. So I want to start by the, with the safety structure. And I think you know, the question is, who, who is working on safety uh, in our district? Who's focusing on safety? And the answer to that question is multi-pronged, because there are many, many of us focusing on and working on safety. In terms of our district safety and security structure, and I will dig into these different groups and their purposes and membership in just a moment, but we have what we call an executive safety team. We have a safety advisory committee. And at the building level, we have uh, building administration and incident command systems in place. And we also have partnerships through PTSA, and they, PTSA has a specific emergency preparedness committee. Now, we're not working alone uh, as a district, so these are district structures, building structures that are in place. But uh, we work in conjunction with local law enforcement and city leaders and community leaders, and those uh, representatives serve on our safety advisory committee. So again, I'll go into some more detail here in just a moment. 
We also work in conjunction with parents and community members through the PTSA Emergency Preparedness Group, uh, also through membership on the Safety Advisory Committee and through working hand in hand uh, with our building administrators at the building level. So I'll, I'll start with the executive safety team and uh, talk a little bit about this group and what our purpose is and who's part of this group. So our, our purpose as an executive safety team is to really set the overall direction of district-wide safety and security measures. We work in conjunction with the Safety Advisory Committee to decide on the safety enhancements uh, that we're going to implement and uh, when it comes to facility safety enhancements um, or personnel safety enhancements, what we're going to include on uh, funding measures that are presented for board approval. So I'll dig into this a little bit more as the presentation goes on. Uh, but as you know, we uh, rely on local funding through our educational programs and operations levy and through our capital projects levy to really implement all of these safety measures and enhancements that we do have in place as a district and to expand those we rely on those local funding measures as well this executive safety team meets quarterly to assess our current safety needs and to ensure that we're being responsive to changing conditions i will say we also typically meet following a tragic event, uh, for example, following the recent tragic event in Florida, we met to, uh, in addition to our quarterly meeting, to talk about our changing conditions. The membership of this team, I chair this team as superintendent. Uh, our deputy superintendent serves on this team as he works with our director of student services and director of school support in uh, working with our building principals on many of our um, safety items. Uh, Barbara Posthumus, our associate superintendent, John Holman, our deputy superintendent. Barbara uh, serves on this team. As you know, Barbara works with our support services, so many of the um, facility enhancements are uh, implemented through that team. Forrest Miller as director of support services, and Brian Buck, also from support services, serve on this team. In addition, Scott Emery, who's our district's risk and safety manager, Matt Gillingham, our director of student services, Rick Burton, one of our directors of school support, and Shannon Partham, our director of communications community engagement. You'll see that those uh, people are highlighted in purple because the people highlighted in purple also serve on the district safety advisory committee. So there's overlap in terms of membership of these teams and um, they, they function in conjunction with each other and I'll give you a couple of examples in just a moment. But first let me just talk about the, the safety advisory committee and then I'll give you a couple of examples of, of how we work in conjunction. So the safety advisory committee is a group that provides district-wide guidance with our community partners in safety, security, and emergency preparedness. This group meets monthly to assess implementation of our safety protocols uh, in terms of drill schedules and those types of things, also to assess implementation and training needs uh, to see where we need to uh, provide more support and also to ensure that we're responding to changing conditions. So uh, Scott Emery, our risk and safety manager, chairs this team. And uh, membership, I didn't include all of the people by name, but here's the groups that are represented on this team in terms of our community partners, law enforcement, city partners, et cetera. So King County Sheriff, we have Kirkland Police Department, Fire Department, and Office of Emergency Management uh, individuals, uh, Redmond Fire and Police, Sammamish Police and Office of Emergency Management, Eastside Fire and Rescue, Evergreen Health, uh, PTSA partners, and our uh, administrators, both district and building administrators, serve on this team. So as I mentioned, this team, these two teams work in conjunction. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, Alice is one of the um, protocols that we have in place in terms of uh, training for staff for um, how to respond. Uh, in, in an event. Um, Alice was uh, discussed along with other potential models at the safety advisory committee level and then a recommendation came up to the executive level for we should implement Alice in our system. Uh, another example kind of going the other way at the executive level, we determined a menu of possible facility enhancements improvements that we could implement through 2014 capital levy dollars. That menu went to the district 
Safety Advisory Committee, and that Safety Advisory Committee, with all of the uh, membership that you see here, recommended that we do the interior door locks, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, the uh, window shades for lockdown, and the key card access system. So you can see that these two groups work together um, in conjunction with one another. The other part of the structure that I showed really comes at the building level. So our building administrators um, work to implement an incident command system uh, in their schools and to have a safety plan in place. The purpose statement here is, and this is actually part of the leadership framework uh, for building leaders. So there's a state leadership framework that uh, specifies what building leaders all the areas that are part of their leadership responsibilities. One of those is all focused on school safety. So the purpose statement in terms of, of this particular aspect of our structure is that our school leaders are providing for school safety, recognizing that physical, emotional, and intellectual safety are critical and necessary conditions uh, in order for effective teaching and learning to take place. So as a district, we provide oversight, support, and a structure and training for each school to then develop a school safety plan uh, that meets all of our criteria and includes all of our components and develop an incident command system talk a little bit more about some of these um, parts in just a moment. At this point in time, I'm just trying to um, convey what our structure is in terms of who's planning for, who's working on safety. And then, of course, we are very uh, fortunate to have uh, PTSA partners. So there's an emergency prep team at the PTSA, in the PTSA structure. Here's their mission statement. Uh, and they, this group meets three to four times per year, uh, really to focus on the supplies and support they can provide schools with drills. Um, so of course, when we're talking about safety and security of students and staff, we're talking about all the way from if an earthquake were to happen, right, to uh, an active shooter situation. Um, so when we're talking emergency supplies and preparedness, there's, there's a lot to this. What I'm going to focus on tonight is more on, uh, I think, what's on top of everyone's mind. So I'm not going to go into earthquake preparedness tonight. I'm going to talk more about the, um, what we're doing to focus on um, safety and really uh, hone in on our protective measures. So when we say we have a comprehensive emergency management plan, I realize that uh, you know, we, we can do better in terms of articulating what does that actually mean and what are the elements of that comprehensive emergency management plan. So a comprehensive emergency management plan is a documented plan with elements that address all natural and man-made emergencies and disasters to which an entity is vulnerable. So, so essentially to the entity being our schools. And of course, schools are vulnerable to earthquakes and all of those types of things. We have, you know, our, our management plan includes all of that. That's not gonna be my focus for tonight. Um, in terms of the elements of a comprehensive emergency management plan, there are really five main elements, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. And we have uh, things that we do um, in, that connect with each of these elements. And I'm gonna highlight a few things and then I'm really gonna focus tonight on the protection element. But before I get into the protection element specifically, I wanna to touch on some of the other areas. So we know that prevention is key and we do a lot of work at the building level with in conjunction with our buildings on school culture uh, to ensure that we um, are paying attention to uh, harassment, intimidation, and bullying. We're paying attention to students being connected with school, with having adults that they feel comfortable uh, talking to, um, that we have uh, people like social workers and school counselors and YES counselors and nurses who are um, in addition to our teachers and administrators that can help our students. Uh, our social workers, as you know, are um, partial at part time at this point in our uh, high schools through a partnership with Evergreen Health. Uh, we've expanded uh, the number of school counselors that we have in our schools over the course of the years, as you know. And uh, we have a relationship with agencies like YES because often there are um, uh, students who might be struggling with drug and, drugs and alcohol and some of those things are also struggling with 
um, dealing with feelings and, and so forth. So uh, ultimately, part of our prevention is to do everything that we can to cultivate a school culture where our students feel safe and our students are um, well cared for in terms of their social emotional needs and where we've got a culture of see something, say something, where students are feeling comfortable reporting a concern that they have about another student or a threat that they are aware of or so forth. So um, part of its culture and then of course we have our safe schools alert system that allows for anonymous reporting uh, either from a parent or a student if, they're, if they are concerned about something. There's a way to report that and we'll act on it immediately. Again, I'm going to come back to protection. That's going to be the main part of the presentation. But in terms of mitigation, if something were to happen, we want to um, minimize the results of that situation. So that's why we do drills um, to prepare people, um, students and staff, for what to do should something occur. Uh, ALICE training is a part of that. Our PTSA emergency prep partners are a part of that. Um, our school resource officers, which I'm going to talk about because they fit into multiple areas here, um, are a part of that mitigation strategy. And then I mentioned an incident command system, and I don't, we won't have time this evening to get into all aspects of the incident command system, uh, but uh, the, a mitigation plan is part of that incident command system. And all of our schools uh, provide their information about their school safety plan into a, what we call a rapid responder system, and that's a partnership with our city partners, so they um, are law, local law enforcement, so they're familiar with the, uh, the design of the school and areas are identified, so should uh, a response be required, uh, there's information readily available to law enforcement. Um, response, again, part of our incident command system. There's a crisis response plan. Our school resource officers are a piece of that. And then, of course, recovery uh, is part of a comprehensive emergency management plan, and all of the aspects of that are included in the incident command system. As I said tonight, I think what's the, the, the questions that I've been receiving um, and the information that people want most, I believe, fits into the protection element. And so tonight I'm going to talk about um, the facility upgrades infrastructure protocols that we have in place and uh, what our goals are. I'm also going to talk about school resource officers, campus security monitors, and our discipline and threat and risk assessment protocols. So those are the um, four parts that I'm really going to dig into. So first I want to start with the physical facility infrastructure upgrades and protocols. And our goal here is to provide two layers of physical protection in our school facilities. First we want to provide, prevent, excuse me, unwanted access to the interior of the school from exterior doors. Secondly, we want to provide unwanted access and limit unwanted visual access to the interior school classrooms. So that's what I mean by two layers of physical protection. First, limiting access from the exterior of the building and then limiting access again to the interior parts of our classrooms. The projects that we have funded through the capital projects levy are helping us accomplish that goal. So in terms of preventing, I'm going to start first with the interior classrooms and go to the, out, to the exterior. So uh, again, since our goal, one aspect of the goal is to prevent unwanted access and limit visual access to interior classrooms, uh, we had a project to install classroom door locks. So prior to having the interior door locks installed, a teacher would be required with his or her key to step out of the classroom to lock the door to prevent access. Uh, this, the system we have now allows, access, allows classrooms to be locked from the inside with a key um, in case of a lockdown or emergency situation. That aspect of the project was completed in summer 2015. That cost $1.5 million and it was funded through the 2014 capital projects levy. We also completed a project to install interior classroom window shades. So that is designed to provide lockdown emergency window coverings that then limit visual access in case of a lockdown. So it's both securing the door <laughs> and limiting visual access into the interior of the classroom. That project was completed in spring of 2017. Uh, that project cost a million dollars and it was also funded through the 2014 capital projects levy. 
We have on, uh, in process, expanding the door locks and window shades to other identified learning spaces. So the first part of the project was really focused on classrooms. We're now expanding that to health rooms, conference rooms, those kind of things that are often used as meeting or learning or instructional spaces, but that was not included in the initial scope of, of the, the, pro, the, excuse me, the project. That timeline is in process tonight. I can't tell you I can follow up, but I can't tell you tonight when that will be completed. We estimate that we built the, that into the 2018 capital projects levy at an estimated cost of $600,000. In addition, uh, as we think about what protocols we have in place, so those are um, structural enhancements that we've made to our facilities. We also have uh, protocols that we need to ensure are being followed so we're using our uh, facility enhancements to their, the greatest extent possible. So uh, one thing we've talked about at the executive level is that we need to ensure that our staff are keeping their keys on their lanyard. So typically staff are required to wear a badge, they wear a lanyard, and keeping their key on that lanyard, because if the key is in your bag and your bag is in the closet, uh, having easy, you know, that's not very helpful. So you wanna have that key readily accessible so you can lock the door, or um, they could opt to keep their door uh, locked and shut throughout the day. Now, we're aware of one school in our system today who's implemented that. They, uh, on their own, they are now keeping their door shut even prior, this was, they were doing this prior to the tragic situation in Florida. Um, they were just keeping their interior classroom doors uh, locked during the day, and if somebody needs in, they just knock on the door and they open the door. Um, what, we're, what we've been talking about at the executive level is making some recommendations to go to the Safety Advisory Committee to ensure that um, we're thinking that through, um, that there aren't un, uh, implications that we're not aware of at the executive level that the Safety Advisory Committee needs to talk through, but essentially it's what measures, what protocols do we want to ensure are in place to ensure that the building door lock project is being utilized to its full extent. There's not a cost associated with that. It's really about training and expectations and people's behavior. The other piece that we're just at the, from the executive level issuing a protocol on is some, something that surfaced recently was uh, that not all of our substitute teachers are being issued classroom keys when they um, arrive to, to, to substitute. And so that's a protocol that should be in place. Teachers should be, substitute teachers should be issued a key. They check it, it's checked out to them at the beginning of, of the day and they check it back in at the end of the day. And so we've already issued that protocol to ensure that if that's not happening right now in our buildings, that needs to happen because whether it's the regular teacher or the substitute teacher, they need to have the key to be able to uh, lock the door should they choose to. Also just, uh, I'm, I'm aware that some schools have uh, installed on their own some uh, magnetic strips so where you can keep the door locked in the locked position and there's a magnetic strip and then the teacher could just easily remove the magnetic strip and pull the door shut. Um, we're doing a little bit of more research into that to see if that's something that uh, we should implement district wide but that's something that we know some schools have implemented on their own. So uh, I want to move to the next level uh, because that, I think th this is where the majority of questions have come and where I want to make sure that the board and our community all knows what our goal is and where we are in terms of process here. So um, when it comes to preventing unwanted access to the interior of the school from the exterior doors, uh, the Building As Access Control Project uh, provides a key card access system that's designed to limit exterior access points. So a uh, key card system access control point is a, installed on a door and then you now need a key card to enter through that door. Uh, where we are in terms of progress, this is in, in process, in progress, and implementation uh, is, is different by site because uh, some schools have portable classrooms and so if you're a secondary school, uh, 
if you have all of the doors to the exterior locked, you have to think about how is the student going to move from portable classroom to interior door during the school day. Uh, and so uh, that's just one example. The other thing I wanted to share is we've got two schools, Redmond High School and Redmond um, excuse me, Rose Hill Middle, where um, they're, they were a little bit more complicated and, and in terms of installing sort of the, the first phase here. Uh, I won't go into all the detail of why. Uh, we, I have given the direction that we need to expedite those and get those done as soon as possible. In addition, uh, the initial thinking was that our schools that are under construction, that would be Mead Elementary, Juanita High School, and Kirk, who are all um, construction projects from the 2016 bond, that those wouldn't uh, be equipped with a key card access system until the new building opened. Uh, I've given the direction that we need to install the key card access, access system at the sites today as they exist, and then they can be moved um, and reinstalled when the new building's open. So that's uh, being done as well. So uh, this project as it exists today uh, was 3.2 million for the initial phase. What I want to make sure, uh, and that was funded out of the 2014 capital projects levy, what I want to make sure that um, everyone has a good understanding though of what this system is capable of doing and how, you know, our plan for moving to its full capability. So this system has the capability for scheduling door access. So I mentioned that part of the issue now, if you have portables or you have how your um, traffic flow is in terms of student traffic flow at a site, having just three or four doors equipped with the building access control can be challenging. Uh, of course, it would, you know, to have um, students have to walk all the way around a school to get to where a door is open during the school day during passing period when there's limited passing period at a secondary school uh, isn't feasible. And so what we want to make sure is that we've, we're implementing this in a way that is accomplishing our goal and uh, doable for the school. So the system actually has the capability of scheduling door access. It's a, the technology part of the system, where based on passing periods, uh, you can, and it can differ every day depending on the bell schedule, to schedule when the doors unlock, knowing that it's passing period and students need to move from, I'm just again using that example from portable classroom into the school, so they need access there. Uh, we don't have you know, enough staff that could be <laughs> at every door. We couldn't issue key card access, access um, cards to every student, but you can schedule that. Um, that's not being done today, but the capability to do it is integrated into the system. The system also allows for an all door lockdown or all door unlock. So uh, again, the capabilities there, we're not implementing it today, but it does have the ability for a building administrator, for example, to, um, through use of a widget on a computer or an app on their mobile device, to be able to, with a push of a button, lock all exterior doors that have the key card access system installed. The other thing, again, that um, it has the capability of doing uh, is for having the key card access system installed on the front door and then having uh, the ability to individually, you know, I'm using the word buzz people in for lack of a better word, but individually allow access through the front door. Where, where are we in terms of progress and if this is the whole system capability? So we're really under, this is under review feasibility study um, because there's a lot of moving parts to this and we, anticipate that the feasibility study will be completed by June. Expansion to the full capability of the system does require initial, or excuse me, additional investment of hardware and training. So additional investment of more access points installed on doors. Uh, if we were to uh, implement that kind of buzz-in system through the front door, we would need camera installation um, outside the front door because there's not visual access from the office where the personnel is that are checking people in, um, you know, in most sites and the front door. So that could be accomplished through a combination of camera installation and use of the system full capability. So again, we're uh, reviewing this. Uh, these, these things, you know, do have costs associated with them. 
Um, it would uh, be about, we're again, kind of estimating roughly at this time, but about $500 to $1,000 per door uh, in terms of expanding from what we're doing currently. Uh, and then whatever the cost would be, again, needs to, uh, that's why I just have to be determined at this point, but in terms of installing exterior cameras to allow for that. And then there's a lot of staff training and kind of protocol changes and, um, and so forth. So to do this will require funding use from the 2018 capital projects levy and potential additional funding sources that would need to be identified. So we are doing a feasibility study. This is under review. And uh, where this would go for additional processing is the Safety Advisory Committee. Uh, because we've got the safety experts there, we have the law enforcement there, we have building administrators there to help us think through what would it really take uh, to move to this sort of system. The good news is the building access control project that we are implementing has the capability to do what I'm describing. Uh, the other piece I wanted to touch on here was portable security. So this is another question, you know, um, part of the bond strategy was to build permanent <laughs> schools and classroom space and reduce our reliance on portables over time. Uh, we passed the first bond in 2016. We all know we didn't pass the bond um, in February of 2018. And, um, so, you know, we still have work to do as a board in terms of uh, our next steps with that, but the reality is today we have many, many portables um, at our sites across our system. And so one of the questions comes up about security for portables. So a couple of things on this particular topic. Uh, we, at the executive level, believe that implementing a protocol to keep all portable doors closed and locked throughout the school day uh, is a, you know, a step in both preventing unwanted access to the interior of the, I mean, toward, toward our goal. I'll just simplify it. Um, and so this recommendation is going to the Safety Advisory Committee. Again, uh, as we work in conjunction with one another, we want to make sure there's not some uh, unanticipated implication that we haven't thought through at the executive level that building administrators or our safety experts or something could help us think through. Um, but that's one thing. There's not a cost associated with that. It's just simply a behavior change in ensuring that people aren't propping their doors open during the day. And one of the issues then becomes climate control, especially in our warmer months. And so that's another um, piece of this. And then what is happening now um, already is uh, that uh, our facilities team is installing peepholes in our solid portable doors. So one of the issues right now is all of our portables are not the same in terms of design, and some of them have a, a visual access where you could see if your door was locked and someone knocked on the door, you could see who was out there. Um, other doors have a solid uh, face, and so there's no way of seeing who's on the other side of the door. Um, so that's where the peepholes come into place for our solid doors. That's beginning now. It'll take about three months to complete uh, that project, and it'll cost about $10,000, and we'll use capital projects levy dollars to do that. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just keep going through the whole thing, then we can take board discussion and questions and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the second part of protection here, which is our school resource officers. So a lot of questions coming up about um, our school resource officer program and um, what we have today and um, so forth. So the goal of having school resource officers is to enable rapid emergency response, uh, establish a working relationship between the police department and schools, and our school resource officers serve as a resource and support for our building administrators, our students, and families. So school resource officers are uniformed police officers. Uh, we do partner with our local jurisdictions to be able to have this program. So um, our jurisdictions are the city of Kirkland, the city of Redmond, the city of Sammamish, and King County. So we have schools in each of these cities and in King County. And so uh, today what our program looks like is this. In Redmond, we have three time, three full-time SROs. They're located at Redmond High School, Redmond Middle School, and Rose Hill Middle School. Uh, and then those school resource officers are available to assist 
elementary schools as needed. So if a school called and said we need a school resource officer here, um, that resource officer could go and assist the elementary school. Um, in Kirkland, we have two full-time SROs. So they're located at Juanita High School and Lake Washington High School. And then those people are available to assist at the middle and elementary schools as needed. In Sammamish, we have one full-time SRO at East Lake High School. Again, that SRO is available to assist the middle school and elementary schools as needed. And then in King County, we have two part-time SROs located at Tesla STEM High School and Evergreen Middle School, and they're available to assist at elementary schools as needed. The reason today it's different by jurisdiction is because uh, we've worked in conjunction with each jurisdiction. This, this model requires resource from both the district side and the jurisdiction side. And so the resource availability is, has been different by jurisdiction, which is why the model's different by jurisdiction. Uh, the school resource officer is an employee. They're a uniformed police officer. They're hired and trained and all of that from the jurisdiction. So the jurisdiction's actually providing uh, that piece of the support. In addition, our school resource officers work for 180 days. They work when students are in session, uh, but they're, they're also full-time positions. So we're paying the piece of the work that they're doing when they're with our schools, and then the jurisdiction is paying for the other part. And again, uh, some jurisdictions actually through levy funding of their own have been able to uh, provide additional support. Redmond, for example, Redmond has a uh, I believe it's called a safety levy that um, has passed in the past, and they're providing um, that level of support through that levy funding. So that's our current situation. Uh, again, the, it varies by jurisdiction. Today, the cost to the district for what we do have is $318,200. It's funded through the Educational Programs and Operations Levy. We don't receive state funding for these things. If we were to expand our SRO program, uh, the district portion of that expansion, again, we, uh, this is not including what the jurisdiction portion is, would cost an additional 750000 to expand to all of our secondary schools, meaning all of our, sec all of our high schools and middle schools. And if we were to expand to all of our secondary schools and elementary schools, it would be about $3 million on, um, that's the district side. On the campus security monitor side, uh, we do have campus security monitors, and our goal here is to provide building administrators support in ensuring that there's overall campus supervision and security. Today we've got, um, these people are district employees, so our campus security monitors are not school resource officers, they're district employees. Uh, we have 18 people total today. Uh, we've got two security monitors at each comprehensive high school. They work, there's two different shifts with some overlap. Uh, and then we have uh, one person at each choice high school. And then we have part-time people work four hours per day at each of our comprehensive middle schools. So uh, again, current model is full-time plus at, at high schools, the overlapping shifts, part-time at middle schools. Um, today, the cost for campus security monitors is $789,000 funded out of our educational programs and operations levy. If we were to expand campus security monitors to uh, be full-time at all of our middle schools, again, today they're, they're part-time, uh, that would be, uh, the cost would be our current investment plus an additional $190,000. If we were to expand campus security monitors to be full-time at all of our middle schools and elementary schools, it would uh, be an additional, the current investment plus another $1.8 million. So, so where are we with this? Um, we are looking at uh, feasibility of expanding either SRO or and or um, campus security monitor program because that's one piece of our protection plan. Uh, we, I, I can't tell you today when the feasibility study will be completed because the SRO aspect of it includes our jurisdictions, and I can't speak for them um, at this point in time I, you know, to say, is this something that they could even, um, you know, could they potentially expand the partnership? I don't have the answer to that question, but we're beginning to ask that question and talk with our partners. Um, so because the SRO program requires that ad additional investment on both the district and the jurisdiction, uh, 
I can't, I can't tell you today and part of how long that's going to take to have that conversation and determine whether it's feasible. Um, we are just doing our part on our, our, our end right now to cost out um, what it would be if we were to expand either the SRO program or the security monitor program. So that could range between $1.8 million to $3 million, um, assuming it's the same uh, funding model that we have today. Now, if the jurisdiction came back and said, we have no funding to be able to, to do that, we could hire people, but you'd have to pay for them, then that do the dollar amounts would, would change. So we're, our assumption here is that they would be providing the same kind of level of match, or I don't know how to characterize it in a different way, but um, their, percentage. their percentage, right. And so that's some more work to be done there. Um, the last part that I want to touch on before we have some discussion is the whole discipline and uh, threat and risk assessment protocols. So our goal here is to ensure that all threats are addressed in a timely and appropriate manner. So this is a high level uh, description of our discipline and threat protocol. Again, it's much more detailed than this, but at a high level, when there's um, a threat that's reported, there's an initial assessment done to determine the nature and degree of the threat. And if, um, let's assume the threat is a, uh, of the nature and degree that um, a, high, a high level of concern. Police are immediately contacted. Um, that we you know, have the SROs in our schools and um, at the schools that we don't, we have direct lines to uh, report a concern to our local police jurisdiction. So a report is made and an investigation begins immediately. Um, that investigation includes the police and the school. Uh, typically, if, uh, if there's a student making the threat and the student is identifiable, there's an emergency expulsion that comes into play. Uh, what an emergency expulsion is, is an immediate removal um, from the school of the student while an investigation can be completed to determine the level of threat that the student may, in fact, um, have. So the student's removed from the school setting. There's risk assessments involved um, that help us determine whether or not uh, the, the student has access to, um, to weapons, for example, um, whether the student um, is assessed by mental health professionals to be, uh, you know, at what level of threat potentially. So we have a whole protocol in place. We work very uh, closely with our local jurisdictions because, of course, our goal is to ensure that there's no, uh, we take all threats seriously and, and we um, want to ensure that we're doing everything that within our power uh, on the district side and on the school side to keep our students safe. So again, I thought for tonight that the, the most, um, based on the questions I've been receiving and so forth, the most um, critical part to cover uh, would be in terms of protection. And so I wanna just provide the opportunity for board to ask any questions or um, have any discussion. Entertain any questions? Cassandra? So, yes. So. Have we gone over with students, and it would vary, um, the wording would vary on, depending upon age, what constitutes a threat so that students understand this is taken very seriously and that if a threat is made, they're automatically expelled? I would answer that question, yes. Uh, at the beginning of the year, for example, as we're going over the handbook, this is one of the areas that is definitely covered with students. Um, and on an ongoing basis as issues are emerging, that uh, yes, it is very much communicated to students that all threats are, are going to be taken seriously. And it's, you know, there's no joking matter here. Um, have we considered perhaps an email to parents so that they also are reminded of what our policy is around threats and they can talk with their student? Thank you, that's a good suggestion. Some communication then, with parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, just a quick question on if we can email the city managers and just get the conversation started about the SRO 
um, yeah. budgeting. Yeah, one thing I, I should have gone to the last slide here just before I turned it over. Uh, so thank you for reminding me. We are, um, as the board knows, uh, working to organize safety forums in uh, each of our cities. So I've been in contact with city manager and or mayor, uh, and uh, all of our cities are very much in favor of doing this and want to host this. We're in the process right now of uh, uh, nailing down venues and dates, uh, and uh, then we're going to um, hold this forum um, that will, uh, we're assuming, again, that they're, I, I need to nail down these locations, but Lake Washington High School, Redmond High School, East Lake High School, one in each city with our city partners to just talk about safety and how we work together toward that. Right, and I know a lot of the city council members have also expressed that um, desire to work with us. So um, that's a great partnership that we have. And one last question, when somebody um, is immediately expelled for a threat or for whatever reason, I know you mentioned the risk assessment takes place, but how, how close are we able to follow what that student is now doing and if they're likely to come back to campus uninvited? Mm -hmm. I guess the so question when you is, say we, how, <laughs> is we the, who, who's how, the we there? Anybody, mm -hmm. um, whether it's the police department or whether it's the school itself, I think we all have that concern. Somebody gets expelled, they're upset, they might want to come back. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if there's, and I realize there's a lot of privacy issues and minors involved and it gets complex, but is there some way of, you know, tracking how that student is doing? And so that's definitely a conversation that we being um, from the district, the district officials who are involved, the building administrators and the law enforcement jurisdiction, uh, definitely have that conversation and plan put in place. Uh, what I know can be frustrating sometimes for parents is they want to have more detail about a particular situation or a student or, and we do have FERPA laws and privacy laws that, um, you know, we can talk about what our protocols all are in general. We can't uh, divulge specifics of a specific situation. So that's where it gets a little challenging for us. And I know parents oftentimes want to know more detail than, than we can actually Provide. And that's the same case if the student happened to be arrested. If the student is a minor, mm -hmm. the police department is under those same kind of restraints that we are, so I completely understand that. I'm just wondering if we can brainstorm around what possible ways we could have to just ensure that that student doesn't come back to campus or we're on extra Mm -hmm. you know, alert and mm -hmm. vigilant about looking out for that particular student. Mm -hmm. Is it something like a temporary restraining order concept or? Yeah, that's, that's as good as the piece of paper it's on, but actually right. eyes on, you know, watching, watching entrances to the school property. I know that's a lot of additional work for somebody. Just, just if we could brainstorm around. I think what you're alluding to perhaps also is the idea of the, uh, as many jurisdictions have the uh, security bracelets where you can monitor uh, the location of the individual. And that's, I'm they sure it's a police department. Yeah. That's again, uh, working with the jurisdiction to see what the local laws permit. That varies from state to state. Uh, I have a question about uh, the building access controls. So in the first slide you had on that, uh, which is slide 17, it, we had we said that it's the 3.2 million for the initial phase implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, is that that initial phase, is that district wide? When you, and is that initial phase, is, I'm sorry, is the second phase then what it is in the following slide where we have the technological upgrades? Or is that refer to, I, I just, I just want to know what, how much of that is being yeah, the really good question. covered. So the initial phase that's shown on this slide, yeah. um, we can call it the initial phase, the 3.2 million for the, the system, so the technology system and the uh, access control points that we've installed on X number of doors in every school. 
Um, so it's, it hasn't been on every exterior door in every school. It's been on, I wanna see if, um, looking to see if Barbara's in the room, about f four potentially. Four to six doors, okay. So, uh, and then the system that we have in place. To the additional investment would be for um, additional doors, not just the four to six. And when you, when I say every school, remember there were some um, yeah. some exceptions to that that we're dealing with right now. Uh, but um, to expand and do it to more doors, and then. Uh, that's where the, uh, re the additional investment would be. And then also, if we were to secure the front door right. through building access, the, the camera installation to be able to actually implement that. Okay. Does that, does that it does. answer? It does. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I have a follow up question mm -hmm. on uh, for the funding for this second. Um, you, you list additional sources. What, what are those mm -hmm. additional sources mm -hmm. or what could they be? Could, it could be um, gen, general fund, which has a whole host of implications associated with it. If, yeah. um, it could be a future levy, potentially, which has timeline implications and those kinds of things. Um, or it could be, um, you know, reprioritizing some of the um, other items from levy. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I know Redmond High has a CERT class, uh, emergency training class. Do all the high schools have them? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer the to that question, asked, but I can it, find out. To me, and I, because I got to know the, uh, the CERT teacher, Redmond High, I think that would be an excellent resource to have on your committees. If, if each high school has one, they ought to be on that committee because those folks are, uh, the one at Redmond High is just super. Mm -hmm. Great. That's great. Thank you. So I don't usually speak from my notes, but I have to tonight. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the calm and professional presentation, Dr. Pierce. I've spent the last 19 days oscillating between impotent fury and feeling hopelessly overwhelmed. Right now I'm both. My oldest son is a freshman at the University of Washington. Columbine happened 10 days before he was born. At the time, I couldn't imagine bringing a child into such a world. I cannot believe this is still happening 19 years later. We should not need active shooter drills in schools. It's beyond tragic that we do. <clears throat> that said, it's hard to balance reactions. Alice drills alone can cause debilitating anxiety in children. Although we've had a few preventive lockdowns in the time I've been in the district, the only time I'm aware of a lockdown in response to a clear and present danger in Lake Washington involved an active bear not an active shooter. Making a long story short, tonight I did not see much dramatic change in what you presented from our previously existing plans, and that is okay. We've been as ready as we can be, but this is a school district. We are the very definition of a soft target. So I appreciate the update on protection, but the most important thing that we can all work on is prevention. Working in our schools, to maintain and promote an inclusive culture. It's not about monitoring the child who's coming back from a threat. It's about making sure we have a, an inclusive culture so the child's not a threat in the first place. It's a culture that doesn't confuse mental illness with violence, and a culture that doesn't breed a mindset where this sort of tragedy is conceivable to anyone at any time ever. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I think you spoke very well, um, and I would agree wholeheartedly with that. I am saddened as well that we have to hold this discussion at all. Um, but I do thank you for providing that and having a clear sort of steps of all those pieces that are in here um, and the opportunity for where these issues can be brought up and addressed and at least thought about in a holistic manner and not reactionary, um, that's a piece I think is very difficult. Um, so yeah, so 
Thank you. Are there any other comments? Questions? I'm sure this is something if we have more in the future, we can continue to hold these conversations as we go forward. Um, and so at this time, I'd like to thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then we will move into our recognition this evening. Tonight we have two proclamations to read this evening, um, one in regards to our education support professionals and the other for School Library Month. And if I could ask Director Stewart, he is going to speak to our Education Support Professionals Week. This is uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, my son has had a para one one for a number of years and continues to need one. And these folks can be fantastic in the education process. Whereas education support professionals are involved in nearly every aspect of education, including maintaining school buildings and grounds, providing secretarial and clerical assistance, preparing and serving meals, providing safe transportation, keeping school facilities clean and orderly, and assisting in classrooms, providing a secure and healthy environment, and many specialized services. And whereas education support professionals are instrumental in fulfilling the state's responsibility to educate the students, and whereas these dedicated individuals deserve recognition and thanks for the outstanding work they are doing for the students enrolled in Lake Washington School District, and whereas by supporting the learning environment, education support uh, professionals are crucial partners with teachers, parents, administrators, and school boards in public schools, and whereas there are approximately 1,250 classified school employees working with and helping the children in Lake Washington uh, School District, therefore the Board of Directors do hereby proclaim March 12 through 16, 2018 as Education Support Professionals Week in Lake Washington School District. I think you ought to know that, uh, I think it was two years ago, that one of our paras was named National Para of the Year. And that's something to be proud of. Thank you. And if Director La Liberty will do our School Library Month in April. OK. Whereas school libraries provide materials for teachers and students that will encourage growth and knowledge, and whereas the school library media specialist role is to provide the leadership and expertise necessary to ensure that the library program is an integral part of the instructional program of the school, and whereas school libraries provide materials to meet individual needs and varied interests, abilities, socioeconomic backgrounds, and maturity levels, of the students served, and whereas school libraries provide materials that reflect the ideas and beliefs of religious, social, political, historical, and ethnic groups, and their contributions to the American war and world heritage and culture, and whereas school libraries are a fun place for students to go, and all students deserve well, a well-managed library to provide for free expression and access to ideas, Therefore, we, the members of the Lake Washington School District Board of Directors, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2018 as School Library Month in Lake Washington School District. Okay, so now I wanna thank all of you who've been waiting here for public comment. Um, I appreciate your patience, and we are at this point, and so I will be calling up people as they have signed up. If you haven't, at the end, I'll ask if you're interested, you're more than welcome to come up. Um, so just as a reminder, on a monthly basis, we provide an opportunity for public comment during our meetings, and the public comment period is a time for us to hear from the public. And remember, there are multiple avenues. We've heard from many of them. We've had multiple emails and a variety of things, and so we thank you for all that feedback and comments and concerns we have received. Um, and in addition, please note that comment is not a question answer session with the board. The board and superintendent will not respond to community members during public comment as our goal is to listen and to learn from you. And typically we add up to 30 minutes on the agenda for public comment. Um, if a number of people are signed up to speak on the same comment, the board limits the time devoted to a single topic to 30 minutes. If you are speaking on a subject that has already been raised by previous speakers, please focus on the topic that has not yet been addressed. That will help us get a more complete picture of the entire situation. Each individual is given three minutes to speak in order to ensure that we hear from a variety of people. Individuals cannot share or donate their time. 
When your name is called, please approach the podium, speak into the microphone. Please tell us your full name and school attendance area for the record. We have a stoplight system over here to the left, and it'll show a yellow light when you have one minute left in red to signify that your three minutes are over. If you can just wrap up, that would be great. It is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting. So the board does not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff at board meetings. Audience members are expected to treat all attendees with respect and civility. So at that point, I'd like to start. So the first person signed up to address the board is, and I apologize if I do not pronounce your name right, please correct me when you come to the microphone, Stravala Magesh. Oh, bummer. Okay, so we're gonna to move to the second person, Christy Jolin. Good evening, uh, Chairwoman Bleasner, Dr. Pierce, and members of the Board of Directors. Um, thank you for entertaining our comments this evening. My name is Christy Jo Lin, and I'm a parent of two boys that are members of the Lake Washington School District. Our family lives in the Redmond area, but we attend choice schools, so we fit beyond an educational uh, area. Um, both of them um, enjoy the benefits of the STEM High School and the Environment and Adventure School. I also serve as the president of the Bellevue Youth Symphony Orchestra in my uh, volunteer life. And I'm here this evening to um, recognize school music education and to thank Lake Washington School District for your strong participation in this area. It's very important to our family and it's very important to our community. And we, on behalf of BISO, uh, want to express that to the school district. We are lucky enough to partner with Lake Washington for many of our events and retreats for our students as well. Um, I did want to provide for the record, and we'll leave with um, Diane here, a couple of statements regarding support of school education or school music education, and uh, we'll keep my time short on this this evening. Um, I also wanted to bring to your attention that research has proven strongly that music education provides academic and social benefits, preparing, preparing students for success in school, work, and life. Um, their education is not complete unless it includes the arts. And it's very critical that we continue to fund and support this area. And just in, I believe March is School Music Education Month. I know you're recognizing those future areas. Music is vital to maximizing their full potential and the ensembles within the schools are such an important aspect of music education. And as BISO, we require that our students participate in those school ensembles. And so we want to just express that support organizationally as well. My oldest son benefits from participation in the orchestra at Tesla STEM High School, uh, which he supplements with participation in the community orchestra. Uh, with the addition of the seventh period to the school day, uh, we would ask that consideration be given to considering these ensembles be part of the school day so that students may have the opportunity to participate more fully. Um, at this current time, in some of the schools, they're required to choose between extracurricular activities such as sports or clubs or the music participation, and this is something that is somewhat of a concern. Um, we do want to just wrap up by saying thank you for support of our music education programs currently. We hope they continue um, to be funded at the level they are or even further. And uh, we do want to thank you for participation with us on the community efforts with the Youth Symphony as well and allowing us to perform in your venues, to rehearse in your venues, and again to fund those programs. Thank you. Okay, and the next person we have is Lisa Olson. Hi, my name is Lisa Olson, and I have two students um, in elementary school in Lake Washington. We're in Redmond. So thank you very much for providing us with updates on the, pro um, on the progress in regards to school safety, especially with the entry in portables, as that's kind of the top concern for us. So um, school safety is top of mind, and many parents are passionate and worried, rightfully so, about our current state. I'm not going to go into details about specific schools or the vulnerabilities, um, since the meeting is being televised, and so I'm going to keep it fairly high level and generic. So our schools are not where they need to be to ensure our children are safe and protected um, while at school. I know there are some security measures in place, but in our current state, we wouldn't be able to prevent an intruder from entering our schools and suffering a similar fate as Parkland, Sandy Hook, or Columbine, whether it's through a student or whether it's through an unknown person. 
We need to help ensure all schools are equally safe and secure, no matter if my child is attending Kirkland, Redmond, or Sammamish, if they're attending preschool, elementary, middle, or high school, whether it's a new or old building, whether it's a choice school, a neighborhood school, and whether it's a portable or a building. The local voters approved a levy to help fund technology and security, and I would like to see a task force in addition to the safety committee put together to discuss options on how these funds will be used to get the maximum value in return. There are many ideas floating around on how best to protect our schools and students, and so now is the time to come together to collectively to listen and act within our realm. I ask you to work with parents, volunteers, and staff who are in these schools day in and day out to put together a list of specific vulnerabilities and reasonable solutions that we can move forward with to ensure our students are safe at school. Um, also, as, as I was hearing you speak about the current processes and what you're looking to implement as well, an idea we had back there was implementing reporting specifically to the superintendent um, for when schools don't actually follow this process, so they're held accountable. So while I was enjoying and loving what I heard, I also know it's not actually fully being implemented. So thank you. Thank you. And so next, we have Martha Diamichis. Hi. Got it almost right. My name is Martha Diamichis, and I'd like to reflect on our February 2018 bond measure that failed with the goal of devising a plan that will succeed for our children. I encourage LWSD to engage its stakeholders in four ways for feedback. First, have the superintendent and deputy superintendent conduct a listening tour where you visit various school communities and ask for their feedback. Second, to do an online survey to gather anonymous feedback. Third, to convene a community partner advisory group. This would consist of non-parents and it would be with the purpose of listening to their concerns but also so that you can give them insights into the intricacies of the school district because I have learned through my experiences that there's a lot of challenges that you face, and I believe that being able to give them insight into this same detail may help turn them from naysayers and skeptics to uh, folks that are understanding, collaborative, and work on constructive solutions. Finally, I encourage you to meet with your elected leaders and gather their feedback. So once you receive this feedback, you can synthesize into themes and take these to a task force or an advisory group for them to drill down and come up with a plan. I expect some themes to fall out. For example, um, are we focusing our taxpayer investment on the greatest return and highest priority projects? Um, I believe specifically that these investments are about adding as much student space as possible per dollar and investing in safety and security measures at every one of our schools. Also, choice schools are a creative solution to build space, but I hear lots of feedback on this. Should we continue our current plan where we have choice schools next to comprehensive high schools? Should we move to just comprehensive high schools? Or should we do a blend of both where we actually use choice schools as a creative solution to build cost-efficient space but open those choice school programs up to more students from the comprehensive high schools. So it's not just a lottery that gets you into the choice school, but you, every student has the opportunity. Um, we should assess all of these options against decision-making principles, such as cost to the taxpayer, time to market, benefit for our kids, and feedback from our constituents. And once you engage with these stakeholders, then it's incumbent on us to respect the plan that's come out because it may not be the plan that I, Martha Diemi, just think is the perfect plan. But if we've engaged stakeholders and we've built it based on their feedback, and we've made these decisions using principle-based decision criteria, we know that it's a good plan that the majority, or I should say super majority, of our voters uh, would support. So I personally am very optimistic about our future. I am really fortunate that I live and reside in my children. Sorry, they go to Dickinson. I didn't answer that question. Um, in LWSD, and I really thank you for your support. Thank you. And so next we have Dan Lee. Good evening, Dr. Pierce and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. 
Uh, I have uh, three children in the Lake, uh, Lake Washington School District, uh, two in Evergreen uh, Middle School, and one in Blackwell Elementary School. Today, I'd like to speak to you about safety. Uh, Dr. Pierce, thank you very much for presenting the comprehensive plan on safety. Uh, definitely at a high level, you cannot go into a, a ton of details. Um, and I feel good about the plans you put in place. Uh, unfortunately, some of the implementations will take time to do. And I, I totally understand that. Um, what I, I would like to point out tonight is um, Evergreen Middle School. Uh, uh, I think Evergreen Middle School is a situation where it needs to be addressed immediately because there are 13 portables in uh, Evergreen uh, and they, uh, just as you mentioned today, that they can't be locked. In fact, they're required not to be locked during school, school uh, time. And even the main building cannot be locked because the student needs to move between portables and the main building. The other thing that also uh, you pointed out in your slide deck today is that Evergreen Middle School and STEM are the only two schools that don't have full-time school resource uh, officers. And I understand it's because of the, uh, the district or the, the jurisdiction uh, assignment, right? Because they're not part of a city. Um, but I also noticed that in your plans for, you, you mentioned that to provide uh, school resource officers and uh, campus monitors, uh, that it will cost $750,000. I would um, encourage you to think about just bringing the level of coverage for school resource officers for STEM and Evergreen Middle School to the same as the other middle schools. And that really is, means we're providing two part-time SROs to just those two schools. So hopefully that will significantly reduce the cost for that. Same thing with the school uh, monitor as well. Uh, overall, um, I'm glad you, uh, you, uh, are, you know, really care about this issue and you have, you have a plan in place. But I do believe there are some low-hanging fruit that can be picked off like very uh, quickly, which is the school resource officers and policies, which you're already working on to, around locking the doors uh, for portables in the main buildings. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. And so next is Loressa Rembis. And she is not here either. How about Taina Karu Olson? Hi, um, my name is Taina Karu Olson, and I live in the Lake Washington community by Twain Elementary. Um, today, I would like to tell you about my daughter's success in Lake Washington School District. Uh, what's making her successful, what her success means for her and her peers' future, and why her being successful matters for all students. From 40 years of compelling research and data, we know that to raise individuals who will be happy, engaged, successful, and who will participate meaningfully in their communities, students who will be future ready, um, we cannot and should not segregate students based on perceived ability or based on perceived intensity of support needs. We know that the least restrictive environment for everyone is the general education classroom with portable and continuously evolving services and supports. We know that this is what's best for our kids, all of them. I believe in this vast amount of research and data, but I also live it. My daughter is a kindergartner. She's learning to read and write, to recite a motto, to share about her feelings, and to do math that she already kind of hates, as I always did. Um, she's disabled, and with her non-disabled peers all day, every day, she is learning to go to school and how to hopefully love reading and cope with math. With a network of right supports in place, she's being very successful and already making connections, both socially as well as academically, that the vast majority of her same age disabled peers can only dream of because they don't fully access general education, the curriculum, the environment, or the peers. She's lucky she's getting what she needs, because I also pushed. She's getting what the research tells us all kids need. Her non-disabled peers are also learning to read and write, 
the motto about their feelings and how both uh, math maybe can be fun, especially if you're counting M&Ms. But most importantly, they're learning that disabled kids, as well as gifted and talented kids, can and do learn together. Um, that no one has to leave to learn, that everyone belongs. They're learning the building blocks of a society that allows for success for everyone, that allows for real futures for the, the kind of diverse population that Lake Washington School District has. Her teacher is learning too. The entire school is. They're finding new ways to better support everyone's learning, not just my kids. They're evolving to become the kind of school we all wish to send our kids to, the kind that gives kids what they need and truly, in the most rounded sense of the term, helps them become future ready. But here's the thing. I don't want my kid to be the lucky one. We have to spread the success and make it a reality for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Margaret Adams. Hello, I'm Margaret Adams. My oldest, no, excuse me, my youngest is now in his last year at Juanita High School. And um, I'm mostly going to just randomly comment on what you guys heard at the earlier board study session on dyslexia. And I realized, Chris, that you are longer than me in my efforts because we consulted with you when we started our dyslexia advisory pack with, the, with Paul Vine. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or what. But anyway, I've been at this a long time, as long as that guy over there. Um, the, I, I, I guess uh, some comments. Dyslexia is still not a common used term in the district. It seems to still be on some taboo list. We're getting closer. Um, the school board approved back in, or was, it was presented to the school board a year, well, more than that, September 2016, to do some stuff on dyslexia. And that took over a year to get started. So the, uh, the district's dyslexia committee got started last December, or at least last fall, um, after us parents had got had a pre-meeting meeting back in April, and it wasn't until a couple weeks ago that we got an update, which seemed to be hit and miss. It was there's nothing formal about it, I guess is what I'm saying. So the fact that there's a dyslexia advisory group, I'm not sure who's on it. Maybe it's me, but there's nothing official yet, and and I don't know when it becomes official and and how we, we get more parents on. We did have a really, really good meeting. Kelly um, Peace, the intervention program director, led. And um, I would actually like to see a home for dyslexia that's not straddling, because I'm afraid that it's scattered enough as it is. And if you've now got two directors, if you've got the special services, special ed, and intervention, both of them sharing it, who's really leading it? Who do we parents hold the feet to the fire? And then who do you board hold their feet to the fire? Um, I know I talked with Dr. Holman about the dyslexia policy that I had met with him and Paul Vine on, I don't know, two years ago maybe now, about using the term dyslexia. And there is a policy that uses the term dyslexia, but it doesn't say we as a district agree to use the term. So it's a little indirect to me. I still don't like it. In a perfect world, it would be really, really clear. Um, I would like, the, I think there's two things, oops, I'll see how much time I have. There's two things that showed to me a little lack of knowledge still about dyslexia. Talking about multisensory only is, I think, harder for people to grasp. Let's talk about systematic and, and sequential. That's way more important. And the rest, I will send an email. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the last one on my list is Barbara Ramey. Ramey. Hi, it is Barbara Ramey. Thank you. Um, board chair, members of the board, and Dr. Pierce, thank you so much for all you do. And I might need to borrow your napkin. Um, thank you for your comments earlier tonight. My son, yep, here we go. My son was a first grader at Helen Keller when Sandy Hook happened. 
and I didn't want to talk to him about it because I thought I could shelter him. He heard about it from school on the playground. So we started talking about guns and safety and school and how he was safe at school because his teachers would protect him. He's now um, a sixth grader. He's doing extremely well in school. He's at Kamayakin. We love Kamayakin. Teachers are fabulous. Um, and my son, I told him I was going to this meeting tonight and he asked me to ask you a question and I understand you don't give answers. So I'll ask the question anyway. Um, you might have heard about a national school walkout on March 14th. Um, we've talked about it at home. I have heard that it's happening at some of your schools. I have not heard that it's happening at Kamayakin, but my son again has heard about it before I talked to him about it. He's heard about it from a friend at school. And so we talked about it tonight and I asked him what he knew about it and he said, well, Cody says it's happening. And he wanted me to ask you if it was happening. Um, so I don't know if and how many schools are participating and I know that there's rules about politics and what schools can do about politics and you guys are doing what you can do here and I really, really appreciate that. I just want you to know that if it's an unexcused absence, if students walk out, fine. I don't care. I told my son that. I said, if you walk out of school to go to McDonald's or to go to 7-Eleven to get a Slurpee, you're going to be in trouble. But if you participate in this walkout and it's an unexcused absence, you have my support. And my husband said, same goes for me. So I understand that the need to focus on learning and the need to focus on the core, oh, what is it, the core curriculum, whatever, I forget the lingo, um, but participation in civic events such as a school walkout to support gun safety obviously is something that really matters to all of us and I hope that that could be considered a civics lesson. Thank you so much for all you do and for your support. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak who didn't get a chance to sign up? Please. Uh, just two quick statements. My name is Laurel Spaeth. I'm a parent of a Rose Hill middle schooler and an uh, older son who graduated two years ago. Um, on student safety, I appreciate what you presented. And I think to me, our best protection is human relationships. Every student needs to feel they matter. Every teacher needs to feel they matter. And I had a question, um, as you did, uh, Ms. Sage, what happens after risk assessment? And I think students obviously will be put back into a school, maybe not the school they were attending, but again, that student at some point needs to matter to somebody. And how does the school work with the various agencies that are involved? I think where in the community do, do you guys pull together? I realize parents can't know all of those answers, but um, somehow there has to be that connection with that student and other agencies, and that just left, and that left for people to wonder. Um, that's what. I guess where I would start with some of those kinds of questions. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Please. Hi, my name is Carrie Gaiman, and uh, I want to thank you for going over the public safety information tonight. I know that's been on everyone's mind. Um, a couple things, I know this is really more of a comment and listening point of view. Some of the things that I didn't quite hear, um, I agree with what you were saying earlier, that a lot of what we need to do is engage in prevention and, and engagement with people. One of the things, though, that I've noticed, uh, I didn't mention my, my uh, children are in the Redmond School District. Uh, my daughter attends Redmond Middle School, and my older daughter went to Redmond High School. Um, but on that engagement point, what I've noticed, especially at Redmond High School, while there are a number of counselors, they're overworked. 
Um, the number of counselors to students is about 275 to one. Um, so there's not a lot of engagement points to try to catch those kids that maybe need some um, additional help. So that might be something that you look at in addition to those um, resource officers. Same for the resource officers. It looked like the resource officers were really per school, not by volume of students. That might be something that you consider. Um, and then the other thing um, is that I think there's an opportunity right now for the school board um, to actually reach out to parents because parents are, you know, you're kind of hearing it in people's voices. Parents are um, engaged and wanting to know, and kids are too, how can they help? And the part that I did not hear in your um, talk was, hey, here's how you can get involved. Here's how you can contact your jurisdiction. Here's how you can contact your legislator. Here's how you can push to get more funding or more resources or whatever. Um, I think there's a great opportunity right now to harness um, a lot of that anxiety that people have. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, then at this moment, I want to first thank you all for taking the time and waiting and speaking to us. And please always feel free to, I appreciate the heartfelt comments. Um, it was fabulous um, to hear from all of you. And we will look forward to continuing to work and engaging and gaining more of that information and making sure that feeds back. So there will be a lot more communication. The community forums, I think, will be one opportunity in which to start that. And there should be more coming along that way. Okay, so we will now move on to. So I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty. Dr. Pierce, will you pull the board? Cassandra? Yes. Eric? Yes. Siri? Yes. Mark? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay, and Dr. Pierce, will you please review the donations? I will. If you turn to tab 10, uh, you'll see that we have a long list of donations this evening. $2,000 from Dr. Dana Kinberg to the District Nutrition Services to provide relief for families for negative lunch account balances. $3,617 from Alexander Graham Bell PTSA to Bell Elementary to provide stipends for their webmaster to support assemblies and field trips. $2,400 from the Emily Dickinson PTSA to Dickinson Elementary to support outdoor education. $1,456 from Helen Keller PTSA to Keller Elementary to purchase library books. $2,000 from Lakeview Elementary PTSA to Lakeview Elementary to purchase a memorial bench. $1,040 from the Mead Elementary PTSA to Mead Elementary to support classroom enrichment. $15,822 from the Norman Rockwell PTSA to Rockwell Elementary to purchase Scholastic Magazine, Dreambox Site Licensed, and to support field trips and academic enrichment. $1,300, excuse me, $13,000 $300 from Ben Rush, PTSA to Rush Elementary to purchase water for portables, support academic enrichment, field trips, and for extracurricular activities. $1,398 from Samantha Smith, PTSA to Smith Elementary to support student inclusion activities. $5,100 from the Carl Sandburg, PTSA to Sandburg Elementary for field trip bus transportation. $34. $486 from the Finhill Middle School PTSA to Finhill Middle to provide stipends for drama. $4,655 from Redmond Middle School PTSA to Redmond Middle School to purchase classroom enrichment to support their choir festival, excuse me, festival and symphonic band heritage festival. $2,490 from Eastlake Tennis Booster to Eastlake High School to purchase a replacement shed. $29,080 from International Community School PTSA to ICS to purchase novels and to support field trips. $2,500 from the Lake Washington High School Baseball Booster Club to Lake Washington High School to apply toward purchase of new stadium scoreboard. $2,324 from Lake Washington High School Cross Country 
and track booster club to Lake Washington High School to provide stipends for weight room supervision, $1,750 from Redmond Athletics Booster Club to Redmond High School to provide athletic scholarships, and $16,280 from Tesla STEM PTSA to Tesla STEM High School to purchase a microscope. So all total, uh, tonight, rounding to the nearest dollar, we have uh, donations totaling one hundred and fourteen thousand three hundred and twenty-five dollars. Thank you. It is always wonderful the support that we get from our community. And so now, moving on, we are on to the consented non-consent agenda. And our first item on the non-consent agenda is the approval of the name for our new elementary school in North Redmond. Yeah, so we are very excited for this agenda item tonight. And so if I could turn your attention to tab 11. Uh, we actually have two schools. We'll have the uh, planning principals from both schools uh, come forward, uh, Kim Belanco and Karen Barker. And uh, we'll start with uh, the new elementary school at North Redmond. Uh, who's going to get a, a name uh, tonight. Uh, we we're going to recommend a name to the board to approve tonight. So Karen Barker is here. I have to say, just before we get started, that uh, the two individuals that you see, stand up for a minute, Kim. Come here and stand so we can see you maybe on the camera. This is Kim and Karen. Uh, they have, uh, they're the planning principals for our new elementary schools, and they have been working uh, extraordinarily hard and doing an absolutely fabulous job in, in every way planning for the new schools that are going to open in 2018. So we're so excited. I think they're probably excited to have one school to focus on uh, pretty soon here in the fall, though it's hard to leave your current schools, I know. But we're just so um, happy with the work that they're doing. And one of the... Uh, exciting things. One of many that they've uh, done is manage a process, a community engagement, student engagement process to uh, name the schools. So that's consistent with our policy. So we'll start now. You can sit down now, Kim, and we'll have you come back. Uh, we'll start with uh, the new elementary school at North Redmond. Uh, so we do have policy, if you turn to page uh, 11 in your folder, uh, that it's administrative policy that specifies how we go about uh, naming facilities and mascots. Uh, and uh, these names come to the board. They're submitted to the board for board approval. And so uh, our policy states that the board shall name each new elementary school by selecting the names of a deceased person famous for work in science, the humanities, letters, or education. So in terms of the procedure for how this name recommendations come, comes to the board, for uh, approval, um, there's certain procedures that are used, and those are specified here on uh, page 21 as well. So the principal meets with prospective um, or current students of the school, in this case it's prospective uh, students of the school at an assembly to explain the criteria and procedure. The students nominate uh, the school names that meet our specific guidelines, then a committee of parents, staff, and students um, if secondary, so it's a committee of parents and staff, uh, pare down the list for elementary, down to six to eight names that meet uh, the approved guidelines. The names are then uh, uh, filtered or uh, through the board, so the board will recall getting uh, names from each of the elementary schools uh, to ensure that any name that gets presented, that there are no objections to any of the names that, um, that the students are considering. Uh, once uh, that initial review process is done, a ballot is developed, and uh, each student then receives one ballot and uh, gets to submit their vote for the name. Committee counts the ballots, determines the win winning name. Uh, we then, uh, we actually do this earlier, ensure that we secure the permission to use the name, so when uh, uh, you are presented with names, we have obtained that necessary approval. Um, so that's already in place. And tonight, the names, of course, being presented to the board for approval. So the final names uh, that uh, were on the ballot for uh, the North Redmond site um, were uh, Pat Tillman Elementary School, Clara Barton Elementary School, Eleanor Roosevelt Elementary School, Fred Frederick Douglass Elementary School, Susan B. Anthony Elementary School, and Amelia Earhart Elementary School. So in just a moment, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Karen, but I'm going to go ahead and read the recommendation here, which is that the Board of Directors approves the nominated name, which you're about to hear, um, as presented uh, as the it, name for the new elementary school. So we don't have to any longer call it the new elementary school at North Redmond. We will have a name for the school. So uh, with that, 
Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. I'm excited to announce the pr proposed name for the new school located in North Redmond, currently known as Site 28. Our school is going to focus on developing social and emotional and leadership skills in children through a school-wide approach to inviting, uh, providing instruction and growth of the interdisciplinary skills and attributes of the Lake Washington student profile. We will incorporate a service learning project at each grade level to apply these skills in a project that serves our local or global community. In December, I held student assemblies and parent meetings at Einstein, Rockwell, Wilder, and Dickinson, which are our four giving schools, to inform them of our plans for the school and solicit their ideas for school planning. Submissions for the school name were entered via web link sent to parents. 62 names were submitted, resulting in 50 names for consideration by the naming committee. Our committee consisted of parent, teachers and parents who defined the selection criteria for the final list to go to vote to include someone that is a role model for students, a person that is aligned with our school's purpose in developing servant leaders, and someone that is relevant to our community. As required by board policy, the committee refined the list to six candidates for consideration. A paper ballot was issued to each student currently assigned to the school in grades K through 4. And following the ballot count, a prioritized list was provided to district legal counsel to secure the naming rights to designate our new name. Our honoree is best known for her humanitarian work. However, she began her many achievements as a female teacher that fought for women to have equal rights to men in the workplace. She then joined the Civil War effort to provide care to soldiers through organizing methods of getting desperately needed supplies to soldiers on the front lines. She traveled from battle to battle, becoming known as the Angel of the Battlefield. In 1869, she went to Switzerland where she worked to get the US Congress to agree to the Geneva Convention. This agreement resulted in the formation of the Red Cross, and it asked nations to agree to protect medical personnel on the battlefield. The resulting American Red Cross provides relief for victims of epidemics and natural disasters, and her work helping people in times of war and in times of peace made her an eternal symbol of humanitarianism. We are proud to announce that the final name selected for Site 28 is Clara Barton Elementary. Thank you. Um, I would now entertain a motion to approve the nominated name as presented as the name for the new elementary school at North Redmond, site number 28. Move approval. Second. Do we know if they both? Yeah, was, can we have two schools named Clara Barton? <laughs> we got that covered. Arm wrestling was going to come. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director Sage that we approve the nominated name, Clara Barton, as presented as the name for the new elementary school at North Redmond site. Any discussion? No? All right. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. Aye. Oh, yeah. aye. All those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you, Karen. Congratulations. Okay, welcome. All right, deja Kim. vu. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I Kim. Oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Kim. Oh, Just before you get started, I won't read the entire situation recommendation as it applies to the new elementary school at Redmond Ridge, but I will share uh, the final names that were on the ballot and then turn it over to Kim uh, for her part of the presentation. So the final names on the ballot presented for a student vote uh, were Grace Hopper Elementary School, Ella Baker Elementary School, S.P. Clark Elementary School, Clara Barton Elementary School, <laughs> and uh, Mary Jackson Elementary School. And so with that, Kim. Great, thank you. And it, it will sound a little redundant, but we want to ensure that um, we both went through the same process, but it was quite separate. Um, in December, I also held an information meeting, Nights for Family. That's where we introduced ourselves 
and we spoke about the focus of our school and introduced how we're going to name our school. Our school's focus is on creating global citizens through service learning. Families learned how our school will follow the Lake Washington School District guiding principles of integrating content. We'll provide specific learning on our interdisciplinary skills and attributes by emphasizing character development and providing opportunities for students to engage in service learning projects, making learning real life. Students will learn about themselves and how they can truly impact their world. We held four student assemblies, Alcott, Dickinson, Rosa Parks, and Wilder. We met the incredible children who will be attending our school. They were thrilled to be a part of the naming process. They were also very excited about the elevator in the new school. <laughs> Uh, we also had a, a chance to engage families. We have hundreds of families already volunteering for a school that's not even there yet or finalized. Um, then we sent out an electronic survey. We gathered over 80 submissions with 40, 40 different names. Our naming committee met and um, it consisted of both staff and parents. And we also had selection criterion, which consisted of ensuring that the person's life work aligns with our school focus and the whole child development. Also the purpose, the person is an appropriate role model for K through five students. And we also wanted to ensure that we included candidates from underrepresented groups. Our committee then determined five names which came to you in uh, January and those five names were sent out via um, paper ballot and submitted to legal counsel. I am honored tonight to tell you the name of our person who embodied the character traits we'll be focusing on at our school. To name a few of these traits, she demonstrated empathy, grit, integrity, and optimism. She was a brilliant black hero of the civil rights freedom movement who inspired and guided emerging le leaders such as Rosa Parks. She played a key role in some of the most influential organizations of all time, including the NAACP. She believed in a grassroots movement, and she believed that change happened by unlocking the power in every human. Her influence was reflected in her nickname, Fundi, which is a Swahili word meaning a person who teaches a craft to next generations. She reached out to the young to help them find their voices. She was a well-respected and influential leader in the fight for human and civil rights. She is ranked one of the most important African-American leaders and perhaps the most influential woman in the civil rights movement. She dedicated her life to service, which is the cornerstone of our school, helping students see a need in our society and empowering them to make a difference. It is an honor to present the name of our elementary school, a school that will work to empower generations to come, Ella Baker Elementary School. So the recommendation, which I didn't get to yet, the recommendation is the board approves uh, the nominated name is presented. So I will now entertain a motion to approve the nominated name of Ella Baker, elementary school. So moved. Second. So it has been moved by Director La Liberty and seconded by Director Carlson that we approve the nominated name Ella Baker as the name for the new elementary at Redmond Ridge East, site number 31. Any discussion? No? Okay. All those in favor, <laughs> please signify by voting aye. 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 Hearing, oh, all those opposed? Motion carries. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you both, and, and thank you both for, uh, for being here, e even though the item was later in the agenda. So appreciate you both being here tonight. Thanks so much. Yes, that's very exciting to have names for the schools now, that we can actually refer to them that way. So on to the next thing. The next item on the non-consent agenda is the approval of the monitoring report for science. OK. 
Okay, uh, if you turn to tab 13, I'll just recap um, process. So at the uh, December 4th, 2017 board meeting, we presented and result to three science. And following the presentation of the report, board member comments were collected and provided back to board members. The board then has identified and documented um, consensus comments with respect to assertions of uh, progress and exceptions. And the board has identified priority uh, focus areas and presentation comments to provide direction to me, to the superintendent, as specified in board policy. And uh, so board policy states that the board will view CEO performance as being identical to organizational performance and that that job performance is monitored systematically uh, against uh, job expectations and reasonable progress toward organizational accomplishments of the board's end policies and organizational operations within the boundaries established by the board's executive limitation policies. So. Following uh, board discussion, the assertion of progress and exceptions form will be presented for approval. Uh, the board has completed that process, and so the recommendation tonight is for the board to approve the monitoring report and assertion of progress and exceptions form for ER23, science as presented. I move we accept it. Second. Hmm? It has, no, I do not see that it's actually in the board packet if that's what you're looking for. No. But they've had it. Yeah, um, yeah we have it. So it has been moved by Director Sage and seconded by Director Carlson that we approve the monitoring report and the assertion of progress and exception form for science. With that, we now open the floor for any discussion on that monitoring report. Everybody's fine with it? The priorities were good? Yeah. Okay. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And all those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. So it's glad that that is the, the third step of getting that through. So that's there. It's good to have, and it's been a process. So next, we will move on to the approval of the monitoring report for interdisciplinary skills and attributes. Sent to us too. Okay, so um, uh, I won't uh, be repetitive or redundant here in terms of. No. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sorry. So we'd like a motion to table this to the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, Tracy, I, I just want to make sure. I don't know if you, I didn't send this till late last week, so I don't, know, it's, I don't think you've had the chance to review it. And I think the board, the practice we've adopted is to give you the opportunity to review something before we're <laughs> approving it, in particular for this one. So uh, given that, I think I would move that we, I don't know what the verb is. You just table it to table the next it meeting. Table it until the next meeting. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so that we will move that forward to the next meeting, um, have the opportunity to review it, and any questions can be addressed then. And I'll, uh, just so everyone has it, I'll, I'll forward again to everyone right now. Okay. Our next item on the agenda is program reports. Um, just so you know, we are a half hour past our agenda. So I do want to, um, there one program report we uh, definitely need to uh, do tonight. And just for your consideration, the other program reports could be moved to a future meeting agenda if, just given the late hour, if the board would like to do that. We do need to uh, do the 2018 school start times pro report though. So um, w with that, uh, We'll move on to that, and so uh, Matt uh, Monabianco and I will be uh, co-presenting here, and I'll get us started. So uh, we'll provide uh, an update tonight on our 2018-19 um, school start times. So my clicker's working from here, so I'll click until I hand it over to you. So uh, three things we want to ensure uh, that the board and our community uh, 
receives tonight in terms of information is uh, we are making adjustments to our 1819 uh, school start times and dismissal times. And so we want to uh, highlight that fact tonight, uh, talk about why those times are being adjusted uh, and how and when uh, specifics about particular schools will be communicated to parents. So uh, this, this has been coming for a while. It has been communicated previously through surveys and uh, information seeking in the contents in the context of seven period day or school start time advisory. But we're now at the point of uh, moving toward actual implementation of that for next year. It's still you know, five and a half months out or so, but we wanna make sure that we're uh, providing uh, ample time for families to plan for the adjustment and that we're really clearly communicating about the why um, these adjustments are being made. So, uh, why this is all connected to our mission and vision for our students is it uh, has to do with the implementation of our seven period day. So just to remind uh, the board and uh, our, our community, starting with the class of 2019, uh, students are required to graduate with 24 credits. Knowing that was coming back in 2015, so this has been a many year process, we formed a task force that included parents and staff, and they were charged with studying, analyzing, and ultimately making a recommendation for how we can expand options for students to meet the new 24 credit requirement for graduation. Matt Monabianco, Associate Superintendent, has been uh, leading that effort, facilitating that task force and managing this process. Um, the other part of the work for the task force was to really dig into and analyze school schedule and start time implications, specifically as it relates to high school start time. So we know that there's uh, research and literature around um, adolescent sleep patterns and the time that high school starts, the early hour and so forth. And so they were charged with also looking at um, should we change our high school start times and why it's not just a high school issue is anytime you make a change in a schedule at one level, it changes the schedule at other levels because the way our transportation system works. So that's the big work that this group was charged with and they uh, took the first aspect of the work too, um, t th excuse me, they took the first uh, aspect of the work first. So what I mean by that is uh, the first part of their work was to really come up with a recommendation about how we can expand opportunities for students to meet the 24 credit requirement. And ultimately, that recommendation was to create a seven period day for our high school students. That recommendation was made in April 2017. And ever since then, we've been planning for implementing that seven period day beginning in the fall. So I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes about why a seven period day is needed and why it's really beneficial to our students. And so I think uh, it's important for everyone to understand this is really about bringing back opportunities for our students that they used to have. So if you take a look at the slide that's in front of you, you see for the class of 2015, at that time, the state graduation requirement was 22 credits. Uh, students had 24 spots to earn those 24 credit, excuse me, those 22 credits. In a six period day with four years of high school, you have 24 spots to earn your credits that are required. Within that 22 credit requirement, students had six electives. So there were, there's requirements in that 22 and then six electives. If you go back to our policy, that students had six electives at that time. They also had two additional opportunities in their schedule, right? That's the difference between the 24 spots and the 22 credits required, two additional opportunities for additional exploration, to take some more electives, look into things that they were excited about, or acceleration um, in terms of AP or more challenging rigorous courses, or remediation. So in case a student didn't pass the class at some point and they needed to take another class or take a remediation class to um, improve their skills and so forth, they had space in their uh, schedule to do that. So all total, if you were in the class of 2015 as a student, you had eight total spots for electives and opportunities for acceleration, exploration, or remediation. Then when you look at the class of 2016-18, 
Uh, we were moving toward implementing that new 24 credit requirement, and we actually implemented an aspect of that beginning with the class of 2016. That was the world language requirement. We knew that was coming as part of the 24 credit requirement. Uh, we actually implemented that part of it a little bit early in terms of, this, of when it was required by the state. So uh, for the classes of 2016 to 18, uh, they still had to earn 22 credits. They still had 24 spots to earn those 22 credits, but their elective offerings went down to four. That was with the implementation of the new two years of world language requirement. They still had those additional two spots, the difference between 22 and 24 for the additional exploration, acceleration, or remediation. And if you look at uh, their opportunities, they had then six total spots. So they had four electives, and then the two additional, they had six total spots in their schedule. When you look at the class of 2019 and beyond, in a six period day, this is what their opportunities look like. 24 credits are required. There are 24 opportunities to earn those 24 credits. There are four electives, and there are zero opportunities for additional exploration, acceleration, or remediation. So our students right now in a six period day, class of 2019 and beyond, they have four total spots. Whereas a few years ago, graduating class of 2015 had double that. As we implement a seven period day, we're really bringing back our current graduating classes back to a level of opportunity and flexibility that existed for the class of 2015. So I won't repeat <laughs> what I just shared with the class of 2015 and classes of 2016 to 18, but if you look at the class of 2019 and beyond in a seven period day, there are still 24 credits required for graduation. They now have 28 credit opportunities, seven periods times four years. The electives are still four, and now there's four opportunities the difference between 24 and 28 for additional exploration, acceleration, or remediation. So they have eight total spots. That's the same amount of total spots that the class of 2015 used to have. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that for um, our board and for our community because uh, it's important to know that this is really about returning opportunity that our students used to have. So uh, that's why we're implementing a seven period day. I won't repeat all of this. It's uh, essentially what I said in the, in, the, um, in the previous slide, but I think it's an important, it was important to kind of lay that out for, for people. Uh, so then the question becomes, so how does implementing a seven period day connect to school start and dismissal times, especially at elementary and middle schools? So the recommendation from the task force was to add time to the high school day and implement a seven period day and uh, add 20 minutes specifically. So we're adding the 20 minutes to the student day at the high school level and we're intentionally adding that time at the end of the day. Wouldn't make any sense to add it to the beginning of the day and have our high school start even earlier when part of the work that we're doing is looking at whether we need to adjust high school start times to later. Uh, so as we implement a seven period day, the 20 minutes is going at the end of the high school day, so students still start high school at the same time they start this year, and they're gonna go 20 minutes longer, and now their day is including seven periods. So start times for high school won't change next year again. It wouldn't make sense to have them go even earlier, kind of counterproductive in terms of what we might be doing uh, later on, right? Um, and so when we add time at the high school level, we do need to adjust start and dismissal times for our elementary and middle schools because we have a tiered transportation system. Um, in other words, the same buses that are transporting students at the elementary level are transporting students at the middle level, are transporting students at the high school level. So you can't just make a change at one level and not have it affect the other levels. So uh, we are now at the point where uh, we're ready to provide some more specific information to our families about what this looks like for next year so they can have ample time to plan for that change. So, uh, w and then we're gonna loop back at the end of the presentation about where are we with the larger issue of school start times because that task force is still in place. It's, it's modified a little bit and we'll get to that. But they're still looking at um, the overall issue of school start times this adjustment in school t start times is really about our ability to implement a seven period day. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt and uh, 
and you can take it from here. I do want to say, I just want to give Matt some uh, kudos here. He's been uh, facilitating this work, leading these efforts uh, for, you know, it's been a multi-year process. It's very complex. There are a lot of moving parts to it, a lot of coordination with uh, other departments and uh, so forth. Uh, so just want to uh, acknowledge Matt for the, the work that he's done. So Thank you. At the beginning, Tracy mentioned, uh, Dr. Pierce had mentioned that we really want to prepare our communities for this. And I want to highlight this again, that this is a change that we don't take lightly. Uh, parents build their plans, their work schedules, their daycare around school start and dismissal. And we want to give them six months to begin that preparation and not wait until the end of the school year. We want to acknowledge that any impact, any change rather, is an impact to their schedules currently. We also uh, want to acknowledge that this change doesn't take effect until the start of next school year. That may seem obvious, but we just want to be very explicit because when you begin the planning, then people are wondering, has something changed now? But it's not changing until uh, the new year begins next school year. Currently, uh, this chart shows that we've had a range of start and dismissal times, and we will continue to have a range. So you see in the second column that in our elementaries, the range of start goes between 8.30 and 9 o'clock currently, and the range of dismissal is between 3 and 3.30. We will continue to have a range of times in elementary at 18, 19, it's moving and uh, uh, being adjusted. And so the range will be for start between 8.50 in the morning and 9.20. And dismissal will be between 3.20 and 3.50. You can see uh, the middle school adjustment that's taking place. We currently have a range. I won't read all of those like that. I just did for elementary. I wanted to be very deliberate with elementary. So you can see the pattern and you can see the range in middle. With regard to high school, as Dr. Pierce mentioned, we're not changing the start of the high school day. We haven't put the 20 minutes at the beginning of the day, which would counter exactly what we're trying to do, which is to address those adolescent needs. So their start times are the same as we continue to do the task force work, which I'm going to mention at the end. And there's an additional uh, 20 minutes that's been added to their day. I want to talk about the process and timeline of how are we going to be communicating this uh, starting this week with our families. And I'll just get, um, if you go back one. So while we have the ranges, um, there's each school specific start and dismissal time uh, communication will be the next step. And that's what uh, Matt will talk about. Yes. One of the things that I actually wrote notes to, and I'm going to pause a moment because I want to say before we explain that process, in working with our transportation department, Dr. Pierce mentioned there's many moving parts. We're taking this as an opportunity to also address some of the safety and traffic issues that have been in the system currently. I want to give you three examples. One of the things our transportation department is helping us with in how we adjust the ranges is making sure we shorten the window that students are being dropped off and being left unaccompanied until the start of school. So the drop off point is being shortened from when do they actually drop onto the school property to when does the school bell ring. A second area is adjusting the pickup times at the end of the day so that students aren't waiting long periods of time because the buses are, are being uh, diverted at another school or are late, and it has that domino effect. So that's that second. The third is by widening uh, windows between levels of when students are starting school is actually helping with traffic flow. So that when I talked with uh, Jeff Miles and said, why is that particularly uh, why is that beneficial? And he said, well, by widening the window, it allows drivers to drop off students at a school, at, an, at a middle school, for instance, when at a high school, they're at a different time. So it's giving the, we're being mindful of the flow in our communities, especially as traffic becomes more of an issue. So I just wanted to mention that that also is part of looking at how are we adjusting the school specific times. And uh, Matt, I want to clarify here and uh, it, 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 potentially, um, and Barbara can also um, 
potentially uh, comment here if needed. But uh, what you're speaking to is there are some specific schools. Specific schools. Specific mm -hmm. schools where uh, just historically mm -hmm. students have had to wait longer than at other schools between dismissal and when they the buses actually Correct. arrive to right. get on the bus to go home. Um, or they're being dropped off uh, maybe earlier than average in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so there was an opportunity to look to at some those. specific schools and see if there's any little um, shortening of windows or improvement that could be made. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm moving on to the process and timeline. This Friday, March 9th, families are gonna receive a school messenger message that will have their school-specific start and dismissal times for 2018 in that message, in that letter. It will also contain a link to a dedicated web page that we will have on the website that isn't live at the moment on school start, uh, that it will be live for them to see not only their own school, but they'll also be able to see the school start and dismissal times of all of our schools at all levels. So that will be helpful for families that have students at various levels. There will also be information and a link to the school start time advisory so people have another way to see what is happening with that task force. So that, uh, I just wanna back up before we get to sort of the next step here. Yes. Uh, maybe this is a good pause for any questions from the board or comments from the board. So the only comment I'd have is uh, I, I, I appreciate giving information on the time advisory. I think it's very on this email when it's going out that, okay, here's your start times for this year. In coming years, we're not sure what, and so just a very brief blurb explaining start time advisory is critical to this email so that we manage expectations. Otherwise, people will be like, well, you just changed it last year. Well, yeah, I want to be able to tell them, and we warned you. So thank, thank you. you. We are including that in the letter that Excellent. they will receive. It seems like every elementary school has this issue of early drop off and there's no supervision. The parent doesn't stay. I mean, every parent obviously, but um, I'm glad that you pointed out that you looked at the schools that seem to really be having an issue with that, maybe more so than other schools. I wish there was something we could do so that there weren't a bunch of kids ever dropped off before their supervision at the elementary level, probably out of our control. Yeah. I think what, what's within our control is uh, the, the trend. When we're dropping off students you know, earlier, uh, and we do you know, through communication and essentially principal communication with families, uh, try to be um, you know, clear about when people should drop their students. If, if, if parents are transporting their own children when they should drop off and when sort of that supervision begins. We also are very clear about how to pick up in a civil manner, but it doesn't always happen in those drive through <laughs> lines. <laughs> That's true. <coughs> and so I just, you had mentioned the traffic impacts in that piece. Will we be informing the cities of these shifts? I'm thinking of stoplights, the school timing, and yes. all those components we of are doing how that. those work. Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, kind of uh, touching on what, what Chris said, we want to be really clear with people that the school start time advisory work is still underway, <laughs> that this adjustment has to do with implementing seven period day. This adjustment really isn't about the school start time advisory. That work's still underway. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this is, these are part of the uh, things we want to make sure everyone is clear about as they're getting this information. That the school start time advisory will continue their work in the 2018-19. They're continuing to study the impacts of potentially changing high school start times to later in future years. Uh, that advisory again includes, uh, so just to remind everybody, originally there was the the task force that recommended the seven period day. And then there were additional people added and kind of reconfiguration of that initial group uh, to ensure that there was representation from middle and elementary on the school start time advisory because again, any adjustment at high school means adjustment at the other levels. So the advisory does include parents and staff from elementary, middle and high schools. They will, this group, the school start time advisory will make a recommendation for further adjustments to school start and dismissal times. 
uh, that, that recommendation could be don't make a change or make a change. So to Chris's point, we want to be really clear that additional changes could be coming um, in the 2019-20 school year. They may or may not occur, depending on this task for, excuse me, the start time advisory's recommendation. And so I want to make sure that people know there will continue to be ample opportunity for families to provide input. Um, there's been already a series of like surveys. online surveys and open house type things. And so more of that to come. Uh, and any changes to the high school start and end times, again, result in adjustments to the middle and elementary. So unfortunately, it's not as easy as just being able to sh say, we're going to start all of our high schools later because when we do that, <laughs> if we were to do that, it has significant implications for start and end times at elementary and middle. Thank you. Any questions? Any follow-up? I just have one. Um, as you speak to this and the changing, and, and we've mentioned it before, or at least I have, is the possibility of transportation of our high schools by metro and by public transportation and that access. Mm -hmm. This seems like the ideal time to at least be looking at that because that's transportation. And so this would be the time to hold those discussions to how that could be phased in and what our potential are. Is that being looked at? And if not, what do we need to do to get it to be looked at? We, we are looking at it, and we do intend to look at it, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we've had some initial efforts, and, and that's something that we're going to continue to do as part of this work that was on the previous slide. And not only are we opportunities, ample opportunities for community, but also opportunities to also engage with um, Metro as well to see what possibilities can be done for high school. And I would add to that that when Eric and I met with the uh, representatives um, from the city of Kirkland, we all brought that up. And there, there is some strong likelihood that a bus that, can, a metro bus that picks up sort of the Kamiakin area all the way to about LW Tech and then west goes all the way to the Kingsgate Park and Ride. It's about three quarters of a mile from Juanita High School. If we could just ask Metro to do that maybe mile loop and then go back to the park and ride, it might actually be doable. So that's ideally what I would hope we promote of really looking for what are those possibilities and where we can do from an equity side point for giving our kids access to be able to get to running start, to want it, to all those places, this is that possibility. It starts to address the access you mentioned in special education actually over at Kamiakin. Right? If we can work better with Metro, we start creating those possibilities to our schools. There's only one Metro stop. Right. Period. So can you increase things and move things? That's the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. OK. So any other questions? No. OK. Well, Thank you. Go so, ahead. Uh, just to conclude <laughs> officially, uh, we do have um, additional communication so what we wanted to do is uh, ensure that this communication was shared tonight uh, we're going to have a connections newsletter item that will be included in this week's connections kind of this same level of information that was shared at the board meeting this evening in that connections newsletter item then as Matt mentioned Parents will receive their spe school specific information from their principal and we'll update the web page and do a press release and those kinds of things. So we're really intentionally planning for you know, the district wide communication and the school specific building level communication. And now I think we're officially done. <laughs> oh, all right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Okay, so is everybody in agreement that we move the culture and arts presentation yes. and information community technology to the next? Please. Okay, excellent. So those have been moved, and so we will now go to a legislative update. Director La Liberty. Uh, here, I'll filibuster while I'm. Um, <laughs> you can read Dr. Seuss. It's a legislative <laughs> joke. Um, this is the last week of this session. Uh, the, uh, there, um, 
Well, I mean, the principal work the legislature has remaining is the supplemental operating budget. Uh, it's still being negotiated between the two houses. I don't have any specifics on that right now. I've been monitoring it. Uh, we're, you know, days left, so I will try to keep the board updated daily going forward. Uh, as far as policy bills, there is an interesting one uh, that is up for vote in the Senate uh, in the day or next day or so. Uh, it's Senate Bill 6620. I'll put this in an email too to the board. Um, it focuses on uh, school safety, what we've been talking about today, um, and uh, particularly school emergency response systems, an incident reporting system, mobile app and providing fund funding for regional school safety supports. Sort of a broad statement of what it does. I'll try to put some more details in the um, uh, in my email to the board, but I think it'd be helpful for board members to contact our uh, legislatures, uh, on, legislators on this uh, particular bill and ask that they can support it. It's um, timely and very important. So uh, more from me in the next, uh, I'll try to get it out tomorrow morning. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So now we're on to any board follow-up. I have a little bit on the ends results and on the process of just something that I think we want to put that onto a discussion point at some point to really discuss that process through and how that occurs. Um, it's still not quite. I think there needs to be that discussion at the end on what that summary is. And so that's sort of the key piece. So I think that's a piece we just need to talk about. And that might be good for, yep, to the extended work session that we have and include that into there. Does that seem reasonable? Absolutely. OK. Do you have anything else for follow up? No. OK. Um, I would have one other follow-up, and that's following up partially with the public comment that was said tonight, as well as some other conversations in the legislation, is considering possibly as a board if we want to do a resolution in regards to school safety and school security and some of the larger issues around there. As you spoke to, schools and security only have one component um, in the sense of we can do facility in that, but it is community in which to address that. And so speaking to sort of those larger issues, the legislative pieces that could do, do we want to put something out as sort of a resolution as the board, similar to what we did with the um, immigration dealing with students from back then. So I would per se that yes, we do. I think it would be beneficial to have that very clearly stated of what we value where we're at. Um, but I will put that out as to whether or not we want to do that. For once, I think it's important for us to just make a statement. I, you know, I usually don't like just using words. I don't, I'm not a big fan of making statements as if they're that important. But I think this is worth making a statement on. Speaking of which, actually, uh, I have another item after we finish this that's related. Yeah, I agree. Um, when, so when is our next regular board meeting? It'll be March 19th. And yes. so we could ask for a draft to be put forward for us to be able to discuss and do that. That, that is like just an uh, early board meeting. Sure. Typically consent only, but we are going to have to change that a little bit to do the That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Would I'd that like work? That. That'd be great. There are several examples out already of place to draw from knowing the city of Sammamish has also just done one and some other locations that we've gone Seattle School District and other places. Yep. Okay, so we'll go ahead and put that on the agenda for the future, and Chris? So with regard to, uh, it, <laughs> it's taken a little while for the various plans around the internet to uh, congeal on a single date, but it seems like it's gonna be March 14th that there's some activity around walkouts. To the extent that these are a, an opportunity for the kids to engage in the political process. They don't, can't vote yet, but they can sure as heck make a statement, they can learn, they can write to their legislators, they can do something. I don't know if we have a formal policy around these things. Um, I just, well actually, I just wanted to say that I've fully endorsed my 10th grader in taking the excused or unexcused absence to do what he needs to do. Um, 
and I don't you know that we need to make an official statement on this, but I know that there are some teachers who are trying to work to make it as useful as possible, um, anticipating and knowing what time it's likely to happen and how long it's likely to last. So um, anyway, I don't know if we need to do anything formally or not. So. I, our high school principal sent out the um, district policy on this, and I thought it was actually yeah. And, and the board very well should done. have received the uh, mm -hmm. communication from me on this topic. Okay, and uh, and then that uh, is going to be uh, included in the connections uh, that's going out as well. There is also an additional march. There's also an additional march on. I want to say the 24th or 26th. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, it's a Saturday that students and staff could attend and participate in and exercise their uh, freedom of speech so they wouldn't have to end up disrupt their school day. Uh, I would encourage uh, folks to consider that as their option. That way they don't have to pick and choose between their, their feelings and their obligations. Anyway. Thank you. Any further discussion on that? Okay, any other future agenda items? Any debrief? Board member comments? Just two things to be aware of. March 15th, Director Area 2, Regional Meeting for School Board Directors. Um, there'll be a legislative rep training that you can attend, being done by Jessica Vazbras from WASDA, um, as well as Chris Rechtel, Superintendent, and actually School Safety and Security is going to be sort of one of the themes that will be talked about amongst the directors is sort of what's happening there within the King County. Um, and then also March 31st is Policy Governance Summit being put on by WASDA for districts that are in the process of doing policy governance to be able to do sort of a professional learning community amongst school directors and be able to hold those conversations of what's working, what's not, and where you can improve upon it. Um, so those are just things to get on and to look and be able to register for. Um, so lastly with that, March 15th is the Director Area 2 Regional Meeting. Okay, so with that, our next board meeting is March 19th. It will begin at 5.30. It is a short business meeting as it will include those items that we added to the agenda, the two presentations, as well as the resolution. And we will then be holding a study session, which will be a linkage session, um, looking at what are our community, a linkage session planning, <laughs> where we get to discuss how we will look at working with our community and connecting with key stakeholders and key groups so that some of the information we got tonight can help play into those conversations. So with that, I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty that we adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. Aye. And all those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Meeting is adjourned.